Good evening, everyone. My name is Chrissy, and I would like to welcome you to the Doylestown Bookshop's virtual event series. We are thrilled to welcome American Museum of Natural History zoologist and critically acclaimed author of Cannibalism, Bill Shutt, as he discusses his newest book, Pump, A Natural History of the Heart, with clinical professor of orthopedic surgery at UCLA, UCLA Dr. Roy Meals. Our guests will be in conversation for about 30 minutes. Following that, they will take questions from you, the viewers. If you would like to submit a question, click on ask a question on your screen and submit your questions there. If you're watching from a phone or tablet, click the icon with a question mark. If you would like to purchase the author's book from the Doylestown Bookshop, click the button on your screen that says buy the book. Now a little bit about our guests. Bill Shutt is a vertebrae zoologist and author of five nonfiction and fiction books, including the New York Times Editor's Choice, Cannibalism, A Perfectly Natural History. Recently retired from his post as professor of biology from LIU Post, he is a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History, where he has studied bats all over the world. His research has been featured in Naturally, Natural History Magazine, as well as in the New York Times, Newsday, The Economist, and Discover. Dr. Roy Meals is a clinical professor of orthopedic surgery at UCLA. He has served as president of the American Society for Surgery of the Hand and has also been on the editorial board of the Journal of Hand Surgery for most of his career. Dr. Meals has authored three books, 100 Orthopedic Conditions Every Doctor Should Understand, The Hand Owner's Manual, and Bones Inside and Out, which was released by W.W. Norton in the fall of 2020. His fourth book, Muscle, The Long and Short of It, I love that title, is slated for publication of fall of 2022. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Nice to be here. I'm happy to have you. I'm looking forward to your conversation, and I'll be back for the Q&A. Well, Bill, you've done it again, a fascinating book, uh, uh, everything uh, anybody could possibly want to know about the heart, and then a whole lot more that uh, I don't think anybody else uh, has known. And the book opens up with a very interesting chapter on uh, the heart of a blue whale, which uh, was just uh, serendipitously um, beached, and then people appreciated the possibility of uh, uh, salvaging the heart and uh, preserving it. So um, as the book opens, let's open our conversation by having you tell us a little bit about uh, that uh, event and the uh, necessary means of uh, preserving it and now displaying it. Yeah, my friends at, at the Royal Ontario Museum in, in, in Toronto, uh, several of them are, are experts in, in, in Wales and, and they'd been getting questions like what's the largest heart in the world and 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 uh, my curator friend Mark Ingstrom would answer oh, uh, it's a blue whale heart no well, how big is it it's uh it's the size of a sedan but in reality we really didn't know a whole lot about internal setup of uh, of blue whales because when they are when they die they sink so back in the whaling days these were not the right whales they were the ones that if you threw a harpoon in them that they would float and then you could pull them onto your boat but blue whales, because they sank, not a lot had been known about them. And in 2014, it was sort of tragic, but, but nine blue whales died on the ice uh, off the coast of Newfoundland, and three of them didn't sink. And they got, we believe they got propped up on an ice floe, and, and they eventually came ashore, um, two of them at least, in these small fishing towns in, uh, in Newfoundland. And, and my, my friends thought, all right, well, this is a prime opportunity. Do you want to go up and we, we can try to salvage some, some of the organs, especially they were interested in the heart. So they, they, they went up there uh, to Newfoundland, had, uh, and we're talking about that they had uh, construction equipment with them. They had uh, massive uh, amounts of, uh, of gear to, first of all, to get inside this 90 ton bloated giant um, and, and then to do, so they had four people, for example, that got inside the whale's thoracic cavity and, 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 and pushed its heart out between the ribs that they separated. Uh, and when they got the uh, heart out, modern day Jonas. They, they, oh yeah, uh, exactly. Not, not, not swallowed though, thankfully. Um, but what they found out was that the heart looked very different than what they, than what they envisioned it was going to look like. When I saw the pictures of it, it looked to me like a 400 pound soup dumpling. 
and it, because it completely collapsed. It's not like you see if you had a a heart that you ordered from a butcher or, or looked at a human heart. It's got this form and it's kind of sturdy looking. Not this thing. It, it collapsed. So this was just the beginning of what what turned out to be a, a really steep learning curve about this organ. And it took five years for them to preserve. They sent it over to Germany to the uh, to the uh, Gubner Plastinarium, who has done work that that probably people are familiar with. Uh, like the bodies exhibit, where you see a guy, you know, sort of dribble in a basketball, and everything looks normal except he has no skin and he's made of plastic, that sort of thing. Um, and this was their largest undertaking. So it took them five years to do this uh, plastination. But what they found out was that you know, the, there were so many things about this heart that were surprising. The heart was a whole lot smaller than they thought, and that was that that was very strange. And now, for example, if you'd had a ninety-ton hummingbird laying next to this blue whale, if you looked at the heart, the heart would be eight times larger in the hummingbird. And we think that this is because hummingbird wings beat at about 80 times per second. And in order to supply oxygen and nutrients uh, and, and blood to, to, the, to the muscles that, that are involved in, in wing movement, um, the heart beats at a ridiculously high rate, 1260 beats per minute. And we think that's about the limit that, that a heart as a, as a mechanical device can, in a sense, an organic mechanical device can, can beat. So the only other way to get more blood to those wing muscles is to have a larger heart. So animals that have high metabolic rates, like, like hummingbirds or little tiny shrews or like little mousy looking guys, they, they've got hearts that are tremendously larger. Uh, but the, and, and they think that, that that's the reason why the heart is a lot smaller than they thought it would be. The other thing is that the, the, the soup dumpling look is probably because this is hypothesized now. They dive deep, and 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 when they do so, they're under tremendous amounts of, of pressure from the surrounding water. But rather than um, rather than try to withstand that pressure, because their hearts are only beating two or three times per minute on these deep dives, it just collapses. So we think that this is an adaptation to deep diving. But there are still there are vessels, blood vessels in a mammal. Uh, heart that, that that they still don't quite know what what they do, so um, so they're still learning more and more about this, and they've got another big whale heart that they just recovered, and they're going to do some comparisons. You know, when you're studying anatomy, it's always great to be able to to make a comparison with other uh, with with similar organisms. Is the uh, uh, plastinated blue whale heart is it on exhibit at a natural history museum or? Uh, yeah. Or can... um, it's back on exhibit at the Rum, and it will be there in a in a um, a temporary exhibition about whales. Rum, 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 Royal Rum. Ontario Museum. Yeah, yeah, the yep, the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Just a fantastic place, and and this heart is really well worth seeing. It's uh, amazing looking. Well, that's uh, that's good. Let's uh, move to uh, humans, and since we each have a heart, and would like to make sure that ours, uh, you know, works uh, effectively for a very long. Uh, uh, time uh, uh, kind of bring us up to date on what's new in um, you know uh, heart transplantation or heart uh, uh, regeneration and uh, some of us may uh, have a very practical need for that information sometime in the future. Yeah, this was a real um, th this to me was a surprise because I, I'd never even heard of this. Uh, but what, what I'm going to talk about next is that. Um, there are physicians and, and researchers, one of them being Dr. Harold Ott at, at, uh, at Harvard, who, and, and I went and visited him, who are trying to deal with the fact that thousands of people die every year waiting for transplants. Now, we're talking about hearts, kidneys, livers, lungs. Um, and the reason being is because um, not only aren't there enough of those hearts, but, but the heart or organ has to match. Um, as far as blood type, as far as tissue type. And then you've got to transport these things across country. Uh, so this is a difficult proposition. So, so, so Dr. Ott is taking a different tact here. What he's doing is taking cadaver hearts. So what he's envisioning is that a decade from now, or maybe less, that if, if you're going to donate your body to science, which, which people do, you would instead one, one thing you might do is you would donate your heart to this uh, to a f specific facility. They would take that cadaver heart, they would take that heart and put it through a, a, a detergent drip that literally washes away all of the cells in the heart that if I were to take that cadaver heart and, and transplant it into somebody, 
that 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 would cause rejection if it wasn't uh, simpatico, if it, if it if it wasn't uh, you know the right blood type, for example. So he's washing away mu uh, muscle cells and and everything else except the connective tissue. That and so you, what you're left with is sort of a ghost white framework of a heart. And what he wants to do then is take this heart, put it aside for a while, then go to the recipient, the person who's going to be getting this heart. Take a sample, a skin sample, cells called fibroblasts, very easy to get a hold of. Convert those into stem cells. And we know that stem cells, that the, depending on how they're stimulated by the body, can become any type of cell. So, And th this technology exists. So take these fibroblasts, stimulate them to become stem cells, and then stimulate those stem cells to become cardiac muscle fibers, grow them in culture, and then take that, the, take those those muscle cells and see that model and literally grow a heart to order for the recipient who's not going to reject that heart because the cells that, that make up most of the heart except for the connective tissue, which your body's not going to reject anyway, um, are his own or her own cell types. So that's one of the amazing things that that I got to um, to see, and, and 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 you know, I asked him, so when do you see this being commonly used? And and he said within the next decade, which which blew me away. Did you ask him about what possibly the alternative of three three D printing a, 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 a scaffold would be and, and seeding it with the patient's own cells? And yeah, the same things that, you know, this type of research is taking place all over the world right now. And there are researchers in Israel who are using this, uh, the, the, a 3D printer uh, to, to literally print uh, hearts. That they, They've got a couple of small ones that they've done that they haven't quite worked up to the larger hearts yet. But there are all sorts of, um, there are all sorts of innovations uh, that are taking place now in the field of cardiac medicine. And as a zoologist, I was really, I was really intrigued that the animals that I covered in this book as far as having unique aspects to their circulatory system. Many of them were, were the same animals that were being looked at by researchers now uh, for practical applications. You know, for somebody who studied vampire bats for 20 years, I'd like to have a dollar for every time I got asked the question, you know, studying vampire bats, very cool and all, but how does that keep my grandmother alive for five more years? And so this was really the first time in writing this book that, that I was able to come up with these sort of practical applications for, for the cool animals that I'd always been interested in. Well, good. It's, it's you know, there's no such thing as useless knowledge. It's just you know where you where you have an opportunity to apply the uh, apply the knowledge. I suspect listeners would like to know what the uh, ups and downs of a um, you know replacement heart, like you described, would be versus a, a, an artificial heart. And you know, we've heard about some of those going back to I believe 1968 or something when the first uh, artificial heart was uh, uh, implanted. Uh, the Jarvis sure. heart uh, right. comes out. I, I think that, and I might be wrong here, but from what I gathered, the 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 whole idea of a of an artificial heart right now is something that's temporary, and and it would be, uh, and it and you would use that because there are not enough donor organs, not enough donor hearts. So to me, it would be more of a temporary thing. Um, uh, I'm not aware that they are that that you know that that they are thinking about having these be uh, long term and, and you know in in in, in somebody's uh, chest for for decades so that's really the difference between um uh, between uh these uh transplants using using an actual heart and, and mechanical hearts well one difference that i understand is that the, the artificial hearts are hard on the blood cells it's hard to make a, a pump that doesn't beat uh, make a you know mechanical pump that doesn't beat red cells up. And so that would right. be an advantage of uh, your uh, reconstructed heart on a, um, you know, collagen scaffold or a 3D uh, printed uh, a scaffold. Yeah. Uh, I, Problems with um, with plotting, for example. The uh, one thing that the casual heart <laughs> observer probably doesn't know is the, the heart's ability to um, beat on its own, that it, it really um, and under normal circumstances, isn't controlled uh, by the brain and doesn't need to be uh, controlled by the brain, which, um, you know, makes it much more uh, practical f to have uh, a reconstructed heart that, you know, doesn't have to be, uh, you know, rewired to, uh, you know, central command. 
Yeah, that, that, that's something that is, um, you know, uh, so ver a lot of vertebrates have this sort of intrinsic stimulation. They don't need to have nerves coming into the heart to, uh, to, to make the heart contract. Um, a lot of the creatures that I looked at, though, for example, like uh, horseshoe crabs, they don't have that. They, they have a neurogenic heart. They have a heart that is whose beat is governed by nerves that come in from the outside. You know, and, and initially I thought I was going to have had this kind of snarky chapter about uh, about um, um, about horseshoe crabs uh, because and it was going to start off about, you, you know, you never see uh, films with uh, Aztec priests up on top of a. Uh, 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 you know, holding up the, the, the heart of a horseshoe crab that, that, that they just yanked out and they're showing it down to the crowd because as soon as they pulled it out of the horseshoe crab, that, that heart would stop beating. Um, very different than our heart, which has these intrinsic pacemakers that, that, that with, with the signal comes from within the heart. But, but really quickly, I, I found that the, that the horseshoe crab story was, was a lot more interesting than this kind of goofy uh, take that I was going to use. And, and that was the fact that that it, that that their blood contains a substance that that is being used in tests to detect endotoxin, and um, and and this is, is something that saves thousands of lives every year. But has put these uh, living fossils into jeopardy. Now, this is a creature that's been around, and and that term living fossil is overused. But when you have an animal that looked the same half a billion years ago as as it does right now, that's a that's a card carrying uh, a living fossil, and um. The, the problem is, is that that in order to get that blood, and it's being done sort of on an industrial strain, uh, an industrial scale now, they wait until these animals come into the shallows, which many of us have seen, and then they harvest them, they throw them in the back of pickup trucks, they run them into a, a in, into a facility. Uh, there's no water. They, they hang them upside down and then drain 40% of their blood, and then by law they've got to return them to the sea, while a lot of them are dying. And 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 so I'm not trying to downplay or or de-emphasize how important they are, uh, because this detection ability that, 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 that they have in their blood is, is very important. The good news was that they came up with, uh, with DNA technology. They came up with, with, with a test that did not use horseshoe crab blood, and it was actually being, being utilized by a couple of drug companies. But when COVID hit, because the old um, style tests were more readily available, then this new test got pushed to the back burner. But the hope is, is that, you know, once we get our, uh, uh, get COVID under control, that, that we'll be able to sort of replace this horseshoe crab blood requiring, requiring test with, uh, with this new test. So fingers crossed on that one. That's right. Yeah, the uh, horseshoe crab uh, committee for preservation will uh, greatly appreciate, uh, appreciate that. Um, you know, carrying on with your extensive background in zoology, uh, uh, tell listeners about the uh, amazing uh, capacity of the wood frog to withstand uh, winter. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I've worked on bats for about 30 years now, and, and one of the, the hallmarks of, of, of bats, especially in places like where I live in the Northeast, is that, is that they hibernate a, a, every winter. They, they sort of slow down their metabolism, uh, and that's, that, that's to cope with the fact that uh, not only is it cold, uh, but there are no insects around, and most of them eat insects. Uh, but there are other methods that animals use to cope with cold, and one of them is the northern wood frog, which allows itself to literally freeze solid. Now, if that were you or I, or, or if that were a bat, for example, and you froze it solid, that would do tremendous amounts of damage because the, the water contained in, in the tissues would freeze into sort of jagged crystals. And those crystals would tear up the cells and the tissues and the organs. But these animals have this unique ability that when it starts well, to get let me, cold. Let me, let me just put a parenthetical point in there that anybody who's taken meat out of the freezer and thawed it and then put it back in the freezer and frozen it again and then tried to eat it, uh, it, it's exactly what you say, that the, the ice crystals yeah. uh, spoil the cellular yeah. structure and uh, it, it's not recoverable. Yeah, like I, same thing with ice cream. If you've ever had, like finished half a pint of ice cream and then you put it, it's half melted, you put it back in, it freezes, it's all, it's all the math feel is off. Um, that's, why, so, that's why I never put it back. <laughs> right. Um, so, so basically what the, this frog is doing is releasing substances. It's actually glucose. And to make a long story short, the release of this tremendous amount of glucose from the liver causes the water to leave the organs. 
and it and so instead of freezing and, and and damaging the organs it accumulates in the abdominal cavity so that so so i so i asked the the researcher i said so so how much what are we talking about here and he says well if you were to open this frog up and look in there it would look like a slushy inside so what they're doing is sort of is is bringing the water to places where it's not going to do damage and they and then the rest of their body literally freezes and they're not sure how what the stimulus is they know that when when it warms back up again that that they go through this kind of slow thawing out process but their heart starts beating at a certain point so, but but the exact reason why it starts beating, they don't know. So I sort of put an alert in there for graduate students that that this type of thing, which was, you know, cryogenics was really big back in the 60s. When I was a kid, it was all about, you know, Walt Disney. When Walt Disney died, the rumor was that they froze his body and it was being held in this secure location underneath the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. And that they were <laughs> going to wait until they could cure whatever. I think he had cancer and then, and then thaw old Walt out. But 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 that doesn't really work for the reasons that I talked about 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 the sort of when when when, when tissue freezes it gets damaged. Um, so there's not been a lot that's been done with um, with cryogenics except perhaps in in finding ways to better transport organs uh, across country or, or across the world with, without them uh, without them um, uh, going bad. Yeah, that. Um... It's an amazing story, and, and just you know, typical of your book is that you, you know, go from ancient history to, you know, cutting edge uh, technology. Uh, let's go for back for a minute and uh, talk about Galen and about what maybe 150 uh, um, in the current era, and uh, what his yeah. influence on uh, science and understanding of the heart was, and uh, uh, how many of his uh, teachings have finally got dispelled in the Renaissance. Yeah, to make a long story short, you know, when I was writing a book about uh, about cannibalism, I, don't, I, I wondered where the sort of knee jerk reaction to that word came from. And I, I could have named that chapter, blame it on the ancient Greeks. And, and when I wrote a book about the heart, I wanted to figure out where did this idea of cardiocentrism come from? Where did this idea that, you know, the soul and the intellect and, and, and emotion is all based on the heart? And I could have called that chapter, blame it on the ancient Egyptians, because these guys had not, not only did work on the heart, they that they 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 hypothesized about the fact that what it did and its function uh, and 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 they also believed that it was the center of emotion and what we would call consider it to be the soul now um their medical uh, that their medical information was held in high esteem by the greeks and and so at this point what you're getting is artists are jumping in and they're they're the reason why they're going oh well the, the heart is the center of everything well well then then we can write all these cool plays and, 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 and poems and stories about how the heart uh, is tied into to emotions, say. Um, now, the, unfortunately, the Egyptians got a lot wrong. And they passed so that, for example, they thought that there were two different circulatory systems, uh, that, that arteries contained air and, and, and veins contained blood. And, and that information was picked up by the Greeks uh, and, and then later on by the Romans. And, and the, this there was a Roman by the name of Gale and a physician who studied in Alexandria. So he got the influence of the Egyptians. Um, and, and what he also picked up from the, from, from the Greeks was this idea of the four humors, that, that, that you, there were these four substances in your body, blood being one of them, that you had to keep balanced. So, you know, so this led to, and instead of take two aspirin and call me in the morning, it was, you know, bleed the patient uh, and, until they turn blue. And then that, they're looking better now that they don't seem to have a fever anymore. Um, now, the problem was that when that, that, that Galen wrote a lot and a lot of what he wrote was wrong. And, and I'm not blaming him. He was not allowed to work on human bodies. But when his work, which was very extensive, three million words that either he or his his followers wrote, um, when Rome fell, it was not his works were not translated into Latin, which at the time you know, was becoming the, the you know, the, the language of scholarship in the West. Uh, and so it's sad. And, and in the early Middle Ages, when it was translated, it was translated by Syrian Christians, Syrian Christian scholars into Arabic. And then finally, from Arabic into Latin. And when, when it was translated into Latin, it had that sort of Christian slant. Now, we don't believe that, 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 that Galen was a Christian. We think he was a monotheist. But that was sort of reinterpreted by these Syrian Christian scholars. And by the time the book got translated, uh, you know, for, first of all, a lot of it is wrong, uh, and then translated into into Arabic, and then and then finally into Latin. 
that that when the, the the powers that be in the church in the West took a look at it, they thought it was great, you know, because it had this sort of Christian slant to it. And so from then on, no one was able to really advance anything in medicine. You had to follow lockstep what Galen had written. And for 1500 years, there was this sort of um, th th there was th there was a, a, a stagnation in Western medicine. Uh, that didn't really end until the you know the 16th century and and so uh that, that that's the reason why they you know in 1799 they 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 george washington was probably bled to death for a, a, a you know a throat infection and if it was 100 years later if it was 1899 they still would have bled you but they probably would have used leeches so it took a long time for medicine to come around uh, at least in the west it's hard to believe that these days you know what the short half-life is of a, uh, you know, scientific, uh, you know, publication uh, that uh, so many eyes are scrutinizing it and the, the, the shingles of science keep adding more uh, layers to the roof that, you know, Galen's writing, you know, lasted for 1100 or 1400 years. That, that will never, never, never happen again. Uh, yeah, I, I also th I think it stands as a warning for the sort of lockstep following of of anything without without thinking about it, and uh, right. you know hopefully, you know unfortunately that still goes on as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the history of uh, cardiac uh, catheterization. I suspect some of the lis <laughs> listeners have had uh, catheterization. And I suspect that it's in some of our futures, uh, and this is a, a rich history that I knew nothing about until I read read it in a Pump. Yeah, um, up until, uh, well, let me put it to you this way. Be, be, before the early 20th century, if you, if, you were, if you wanted to get into the heart, the only way you could do it would be, you know, you could use a hypodermic needle and put it through the chest. The heart is beating. And now you're, you know, this, you're doing this blind. If you, if you clip a, a coronary artery, you, you could kill the person um, or you would open them up. Um, and so there was a, um, th there was a physician uh, by the name of Werner Frostman in the, 1920s, who was thinking about a, a, a different way to approach that type of direct delivery to the heart. Um, and that would be for, you know, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, for example, me measure pressure or to, uh, or, or to get a, um, get some type of medicine directly into the heart, how you could do it. And he saw these pictures, old pictures that showed um, a horse where the, these researchers had taken a, a, a a long a, a, um, a urethral catheter and 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 put it they anesthetized the outside the the jugular vein and they ran this thing into the horse's heart and hooked it up to a pressure monitor and they were able to measure the pressure inside the left ventricle uh, in, inside the left atrium um and so no excuse me into the right atrium um and so frostman thought this might be a way to to you know that, that this should be should be explored and and he was a at the time he was a resident uh, at a hospital in berlin and this is 1928 so it's sort of between world wars and um and and his supervisors immediately gave it the thumbs down and and why this story became something that if you were to ask me to write write a fictional account of of, of how the first heart catheterization came about why i couldn't come up with anything this this wild he talks a nurse into helping him do this catheterization and she actually volunteers and and so they sneak into the hospital at night no one very few people there um but but she doesn't know it but but the only reason that he wants her there is because she's got the key to the cabinet that's got the urethral catheters so she opens it up they take out the catheters he brings her up into a up in, into an operating room and he says I think we should strap you down for this one. And you can imagine what must be going through her head um, as he straps her down and then leaves uh, and probably comes back 10, 15 minutes later. And meanwhile, he has made a, a, an incision in his, in his arm by his antecubic vein and run this catheter up his own arm. Um, and, 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 and she, she's now, I can just imagine this, what this conversation would have been like as he unties her because they now have to go, in order to prove this, they've got to get some type of, 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 of physical document. So they go to the radiology room, and, and there was a fluoroscope there, which sort of does 
um, real-time imagery, like a, almost like an X-ray. And and so the 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 radiologist who's on duty gets talked into allowing Frostman to to get behind the screen. And and when they 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 show the his picture, the catheter hasn't gotten into his heart yet, so he's got to advance it another eight inches. Meanwhile, one of his colleagues comes in and is freaking out and is trying to pull this catheter out of his arm. He fights this guy off. They finally get the 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 the, the, the fluoroscopy evidence, um, and and his supervisors are not happy the next day, um, and and. Within a year, he's released from the hospital because because all of the media, there's, they, they, you know, the word is out that he's done this to to get publicity. In reality, he really hasn't. So he gets fired, um, and winds up uh, working in another hospital. And he keeps doing these experiments on himself and getting into more and more trouble. To 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 put an end on this, when he finally writes this book years later, it's called Experiments on Myself. So you, you could tell he was using himself as a as a guinea pig to hone this 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 technique that has gotten incredible. You know, it, it, it's been used for all sorts of things now. Like um, so, for example, installing valves on people. Um, that that's how this is done. They run a catheter up you. They don't, they don't have to you don't have to open your chest anymore. Um, World War II, he serves as a surgeon. Unfortunately, he has a Nazi affiliation. So when the war ends, he's a POW. Um, when the war ends, uh, he's not allowed to practice. Um, so for years, he's sitting by now, watching as 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 across the world now, especially in places like the United States, uh, cardiac catheters are being used commonly. Uh, so he's finally allowed to come back and 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 practice and make a to make a long story just a tiny bit shorter. He wins the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, but but just you know, yeah, it was 19, I think you you said in the book it was 1956 or something that he won the. Uh, Thereabouts that he won the Nobel Prize. That's after a couple of years of him having to spend, a, 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 you know, make a living as a lumberjack. So yeah, the story is uh, is a strange one. Yeah. Well, I just like to let the audience know that that uh, Bill's book is uh, full of uh, uh, amazing uh, you know, stories like this that uh, kind of are spokes off the wheel of a um, you know the heart, you know, as being a central organ uh, for us. And so uh, I found the book. Uh, you know, incredibly readable. Uh, Bill's sense of humor uh, comes through in it, and uh, there are amazing stories of blood transplantation, uh, uh, b blood uh, transfusions, um, the history of uh, auscultation of the heart in terms of you know listening to the sounds. Is that ancient doctors would just put their ear against the patient's chest to be able to hear um, uh, heart murmurs and so forth, and then. Uh, Lynette came along, and you want to briefly tell us about uh, the advance that uh, Lynette made for um, cardiac uh, auscultation. Yeah, in 1816, there was a, a terrible outbreak of what they were calling consumption in Paris, and, and, and that's because it sort of ate, they thought it sort of consumed the person from within. Uh, we now um, know that, that, it is, uh, that it is something quite different than that. Roy, we, you know what that is. Tuberculosis, yeah. Yes, TB, and and so they had no idea about things like bacteria that caused tuberculosis uh, at, at the time. Um, so one of the ways that they would um, that that they would uh, characterize it and 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 uh, you know, listen for uh, for symptoms uh, would be to, to to listen to your chest. And they were they were listening for a fluid buildup at the time. Now back in in, in you know in 1816, um, there were problems with that. And and being um, uh, some some people were didn't bathe. Other people had uh, had lice. Uh, then there was the sort of problem about putting your if you were a male if you were a doctor and you were putting your you know your your ear to to, to the to the chest of a, of a woman uh, that that this was uh, sort of frowned upon as well. Lenake was supposedly walking in a park one day um, and saw two kids playing and 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 they had a, a branch and and one of them had the branch up to his ear uh, and the other one was. Was tapping on the on, on on the far end of the branch, and it, from there he got the idea of uh, of a stethoscope. So he created a simple tube that he was then able to use to characterize um, uh, heart sounds, sounds of the chest, uh, and this is something that is still in use today. Of course, uh, a, a high tech, um, uh, but but nonetheless uh, a very important uh, tool in uh, in in uh, in the utility belt of, of of physicians, and it has been since that time.
Yeah, his first uh, stethoscope, as I recall, was was a hollow tube, maybe 12 inches long and an inch and a half in diameter or so forth. And then gradually that morphed into the, um, you know, flexible tubing, uh, you know, ear earbuds and, uh, you know, a diaphragm that is slung over every doctor's shoulder on any uh, television uh, uh, show of the uh, of the hospital. Well, Bill, what's uh, what's next? What do you, uh, you're an uh, uh, energetic writer. You're not going to uh, rest on your laurels of this. Uh, give people an idea what uh, what they can expect in a couple of years. Well, so I, so I just submitted a, um, a a novel, a completed novel that'll be for uh, for for upper middle grades uh, to my agent, and that's a, a sort of a, a World War II story that takes place in Canada. Um, and I'm currently working on another nonfiction book, and, and that is about teeth. So uh, that one's not due till April. So I imagine it'll be out somewhere you know, sometime late in uh, in 2022 uh, or early 2023. Um, so yeah, and 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 that one is uh, that that's turning out to be just as interesting as uh, as the heart and and as cannibalism. You, you know, so so I'm. I'm I'm finding things out that are that that are blowing me away. So I, it's it's keeping me keeping me busy. One thing I, I did want to mention was that 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 you have a book that is, was released relatively recently, and it is really wonderful. So I just wanted to put in a plug for for Bones Inside and Out. Well, right. The, the inside is the the living part of uh, bone, and you know it's immediately under our skin, but we you know, ideally never get to see our own bone, uh, but that it has wonderful stories, just like your stories of the heart uh, of living bone. And then the, the outside part, the second part of the book is uh, the um, bone and its second life and how it reflects on uh, natural history, you know, going back before the dinosaurs, uh, uh, reflecting on natural history, but then also, you know, cultural and human history in terms of the uh, things that uh, humans have repurposed bone into spear points and um, necklace beads and, um, you know, everything else and how that uh, uh, affects a, a popular culture. So, yeah, that book's been out a year. And like you say, uh, you know, here we are uh, in uh, uh, maybe retirement or semi-retirement from our uh, primary job of uh, decades, but that we're having a grand time, it seems, of uh, exploring uh, uh, side streets of our um, uh, uh, levels of expertise and, uh, uh, you know, enjoying the uh, discovery and then enjoying uh, writing it and uh, sharing it with other people. And that's certainly been the case uh, with uh, your book on uh, Pump. Uh, congratulations on it. It was a uh, thank you. Uh, incredibly interesting uh, read. And uh, I learned, uh, learned so much. Thank right. you very much. Well, we have a few questions from our viewers. The first one is coming from Hillary, who's actually one of our booksellers at our Lahaska store. Hello, Hillary. Um, okay, this could be for both of you actually, so I'll have Bill answer first. A lot of people think of research as being dry or boring. Can you describe a moment of excitement or joy in your research for this book or any of your books, Bill? I, 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 if you know, I'm enthusiastic about everything that I work on. I, I'm just so lucky to be able to do what I do. I, you know, I travel all over the world studying bats. Who gets to do that? I, I, I never, <laughs> I've never gotten used to or bored with, um, with, with what I'm, I've been lucky enough uh, to, to, to be able to, to do um, as far as my research goes. Uh, I just, you know, uh, the, the people that, that have been mentors and and my friends and my colleagues uh, are just it's an unbelievable experience and I'm always thrilled and excited by I never find it dry. How about you, Roy? Well, I think Bill and I are just naturally curious uh, uh, people, and that uh, you know I was a biology major in in, uh, in college and then medical school and got fascinated with musculoskeletal system, so. Um, you know, did an orthopedic uh, surgery residency. So, you know, I've been interested in bones for pretty much since I was a teenager. And, uh, uh, you know, researching the, the bones book, uh, they didn't go by uh, that I didn't learn something new. And, and a lot of that was on the internet. I have access to the 
UCLA library, which gives me access to the world's literature. And, and so just amazing things would turn up that I had, had no idea of. And then the other fun thing about uh, researching bones was that um, go to a natural history museum, go to a fine art museum, uh, maritime museums, uh, musical museums, uh, unbelievable places that uh, I'd make these serendipitous discoveries about, uh, about bone. And so uh, researching the muscle book is that there wasn't as much in museums, but that you know, muscle is a bone's nearest friend and the, uh, uh, the library and the access to the world's literature, it's, it's just been, <laughs> you know, I, I start on a topic and, and look at two articles and then I read a, uh, one of their bibliographic citations and, and then read one of its bibliographic citations. And, you know, two hours later, I'm way out on the, uh, tiny twigs of a, a branch on the tree that I never even knew, uh, you know, that there was a, a trunk of. And I say, how did I get here? <laughs> but I've had so much fun uh, learning about it. And then, uh, you know, finally try to organize it and, and uh, write about it. Uh, it uh, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. I know Bill does the same, uh, has the same uh, uh, sense of discovery with it. Oh yeah, a lot of tangents, no doubt, and and they're they're all over the book, and and whatever books I write go off on. You just don't know. You start out thinking you're going to be working on one thing, and uh, and it just turns into something completely different. And that's that, that's the that's the thrill of it. Who would who would believe on this Saturday I'm going to go to a bodybuilding contest? Uh, just, how how can I write about bodybuilding if I don't if I don't walk the walk? <laughs> As a contestant, then. Uh, no, not this time. <laughs> I'd either have to get bigger muscles or smaller t-shirts. <laughs> oh, all right, Bill, I can't see you. Roy, can you there see you Bill? Are. You see him? Oh, I'm, I can see me. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, you're okay. Back. Yeah. That's okay. All right, so we'll go on to our next question, which is from Ed. Thank you, Ed. Um, this is for Bill. Have you learned anything in your research that would help improve the health slash longevity of human hearts? Yeah, uh, that that was like, you know, I'm a zoologist, so of course I wanted to cover all of these really neat animals, and but it just it just turned out that that so many of them were being studied now by researchers who are looking. For the practical sort of uh, practical aspects of of of, of what uh, of, of what they're finding. Uh, so, for example, there's a horrible problem with invasive species, uh, Burmese pythons in 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 the Everglades. Uh, but there's a researcher by the name of, Le of Leslie Leanwind, uh, who's at the University of Colorado, who's discovered that when uh, when a python has a a meal, and you know you've seen pictures of them and they eat these things whole. Um, their hearts grow 40% in size. And so when we think of, of, of heart enlargement, we think it's a bad thing. And that's sort of pathogenic uh, heart growth. But this is healthy heart growth that would take place, for example, if you were in an exercise regime. So what these researchers are going to do is um, not, uh, not, to, not to replace exercise, but there are some people that are not able to go into a, a, a not able to exercise very much after they have some type of a medical problem because their hearts are not are strong are not strong enough for it. So, can we then take the substances that we find in the python blood um, and give it to these people as a medication so that there's healthy heart growth in these folks that can't otherwise um, experience that type of thing? So, all sorts of examples that that tie into that that type of work on on other species. Um, you know, the, the one that really jumps out at me besides that, you can read about in the book, and it's it's about zebrafish and how their hearts are, are able to repair themselves after you clip off 20% of the heart and try to do that with a human, uh, and that, that's, that heart's just not ever going to, uh, to work again. And a second part, are there any animal hearts uh, particularly good at staying healthy? Well, most of them are. I mean, they, that, that's a that's a, an interesting question because we have this idea that the human is the uh, you know the ultimate, and that the the, the, the others are uh, deficient in some way or, or or primitive, and that's just not the case. Um, whether you're looking at 
uh, at, at the aortic arches of an earthworm, or you're looking at the bizarre little muscular structures that 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 send the, the equivalent of blood around an insect's body, they all work very very well. Um, and and it's so we need to get away from this idea that just because our heart is this beautiful thing you know, that that it's the best that there is, the complexity that it uh, leads to all the problems. Uh, but sort of, uh, so I, I hope that's answered your 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 question. I'm, I'm not I'm not sure it has or not. Well, you know, I would I mean, for instance, Greenland sharks um, live in very cold water and they're very slow metabolism, but they, you know, live three to five hundred years, uh, so their heart, uh, you know, lasts that uh, long. Uh, I think you know humans have gotten into a problem because uh, we it's it's too easy for us to eat. You know, when uh, our uh, uh, ancient ancestors were hunting and gathering, they had to work hard and exert themselves physically every day to, number one, exercise their heart, and number two, just to, you know, have a subsistence uh, diet. But now with the um, bounty of food in, in first world countries is that, uh, uh, you know, we eat too much and our heart uh, uh, suffers uh, from it. So we, we have good Yeah, hearts. we don't get enough exercise. We just don't take good care of them. You know, and of course, tobacco is terrible. Uh, in that regard uh, uh, as well. So, um, you know, we know that the human heart has the potential to live 100 or 110 years and to think that it never takes a day off or never takes a long weekend uh, and it can continue pumping at, you know, 60 to 100 times a minute for, you know, over 100 years is, you know, that is what the potential is, but that unfortunately most people don't uh, realize that potential because of their lifestyle. Uh, we have a question from Cindy, who is a dentist. Uh, she's wondering how they can get information um, on the book on teeth, um, when it's coming out, what, what a possible title might be. Oh, um, yeah, I would think that it's not due to the publisher till um, till April. So I would think it will be out in 2020, but Al is, is, um, is publishing it. So um, you can find out. You can just Google me and, and see the books that, that are available. And they're all out there and they're all in you know any type of format that you like from whatever bookseller. Uh, I would I'd purchase mine at the Doylestown bookshop personally. <laughs> um, but of course. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. But um but uh, but uh, you can look me up at billshot.com uh, and 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 find out about my books. But but they the, our publicity department is, is fantastic at, at Algonquin. I don't think it'll be problematic to to figure it out when it's out. But thank you. And our last question um, for Bill. What did you come across that made you decide to research the heart? Or when did you know that uh, that was going to be the direction you were going in for this book? Yeah, that's a good question because my first book was a blood, about blood feeding creatures, you know, Dark Banquet, and my second one was about cannibalism. So when the and that did really well. And when the when I was thinking about this list of things to do in my, uh, for the third book, the heart was not on that list. And my agent and my and my editor Al, at Algonquin suggested that I that, that perhaps I look at something a bit more mainstream. And and they gave me a a short list, and 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 the heart was was on it. And and I initially thought that, that that I wouldn't be able to figure out how to write my type of book. With you know, this is this is not this is not a textbook. It's not an encyclopedia. I don't I, I don't use a lot of jargon. I like to entertain. I like to tell stories that are that are memorable that you might repeat at a, a you know at a you know at, at a dinner table. Um, funny, that that type of thing. And and it, once I started to do the research and realized that 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 book had not been written yet, and that to me was. Now, that was a surprise, given the importance of the heart. Uh, th then I was, then I just jumped in with both feet, and 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 the more research I did, uh, the the more excited and uh, intrigued I got about the topic. Well, that does it for our questions. Do you have anything else you'd like to add before we end this event? It's been fun. I always enjoy talking to Bill. And, uh... Yeah, this is great. Always, always good to see you, Roy. Thank you. Oh, well, I'd like to thank, and thank you, you for both. having us on. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time. This is a fascinating book. We have copies of that and Bones at the Doylestown Bookshop if you'd like to pick up a copy. Um, we look forward to your next books and hopefully we can have an event with you in person next time.
Great. All right. Well, might be moving there one of these. Uh, let us know. <laughs> let us know. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I don't mean into your oh. bookstore. I mean Doylestown. Oh, well, yeah, that might be problematic if you moved into the bookstore, but you know. <laughs> Thank He's you so clean. much. <laughs> Thank you everyone for watching and have a great night. Thank you.